On behalf of the Center for Palestine Studies, uh, I want to welcome you all to a webinar on uh, the new book by Professor Louis Fishman entitled Jews and Palestinians in the Late Ottoman Era, 1908 to 1914, and the subtitle is Claiming the Homeland. Um, <clears throat> I am going to, uh, uh, I'll introduce myself in a second. I'm Rashid Khadi. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm the Edward Said Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia. Um, and I'm one of the founders of the Central Palestine Studies, which is now in its 10th year of operation. And one of the main things that we do is we try and showcase new scholarship uh, on Palestine with book talks like this. Normally, we are able to do it in person. Uh, normally, we have an audience of maybe 15 to 30 people. Uh, right now, we have 81 participants on Zoom and uh, who knows how many uh, streaming live on Facebook. So uh, in spite of the misery that the uh, uh, this pandemic has caused us all, uh, it's enabled us to expand our audience and to reach people that we probably wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise. Before we begin, let me uh, give you a technical note. We have been experiencing some difficulties uh, with Zoom, um, and so hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be good, uh, but there is a possibility this might be interrupted. Uh, if it is, I ask for your forbearance. I don't know if we'll be able to bring it back. If we can, we will. Uh, if we can't, we'll simply just have to reschedule. But I hope things will go well. Um, okay, uh, I've already mentioned the book. I'll, I'll repeat the title. The title of the book that we're going to be discussing today is Jews and Palestinians in the Late Ottoman Era, 1908 to 1914, Claiming the Homeland. Uh, this is a book by uh, Professor Louis Fishman, who is an associate uh, professor at Brooklyn College uh, in uh, the City University of New York. Um, he got his PhD. Uh, back in the day in Chicago, uh, where he worked, among others, with me. Um, so we are old. We've known each other for a very, very long time. And it's an enormous pleasure uh, to host him. Um, and his book, uh, I, 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 I was talking to Louis before we started, and he mentioned to me that his book party at Brooklyn College was possibly the last public event the two of us attended <laughs> before. Um, <laughs> The curtain came down and public events ended. So I'm happy that we're able to uh, host him uh, at Columbia virtually Last. for this book talk. So uh, this is what we're going to do. Uh, uh, Professor Fishman will talk for 20 minutes, maybe. Uh, I'll say a few words afterwards, a few comments, and then we'll open the floor to questions. And just so that you know, we will be taking questions through Q&A. We can't see you, uh, but I will field the questions and I will feed them to Professor Fishman so he doesn't have to look at Q&A and think about an answer at the same time. Okay, um, so without any further ado, let us proceed. Uh, uh, Professor Fishman, please, can you say a few words about your book and then we'll, 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 we'll proceed from there. Great, perfect. Thanks so much for the, for the nice welcome. And yes, it was last year then we last saw each other at the book party. And then this was before we knew about Zoom and we had to cancel my book talk at Columbia and it took time for us to, to get things together. So it's really honored to be here and to present this to Center for Palestine Studies. Um, as people will see this, this book is, I think I, I would say multitask with a multitude of things because in, in some senses, it's very much about you know Palestinian studies. But it's also very much about the studies of the Yeshuv and Jewish studies. And I think um, uh, it needs to be heard at, at, at both places. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes not always together as academia. It's not because it's Palestine, Israel, Palestine, Jewish, but for the sort of the, the, the state of academia, how it is. Let me go ahead and I'm going to share a PowerPoint and I'm going to give like a 15 minute talk uh, about the book, highlighting the, the main arguments. And then we can, um, then we can go ahead and uh, we can go ahead and uh, start. Um, very good. So let me go full screen here. And hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties. I see that um, another another center is signing in right now. So we'll see how long this lasts. Okay, very, very good. So yes, the book's called Jews and Palestinians in the Late, Late Ottoman Era, 1908-1914, Claiming uh, the Homeland. And you, you know, when I, before I even start, I was thinking this map here, I found it actually, it's from a pocket atlas from 1913. And I found it on Istiklal Jadisi in, in Istanbul. And, and, you know, when I first saw it, I said, you know, when my book comes out, I want to use this map. It's a very colorful map. Uh, you know, of course, a, it's important also because to see 
what's on it now and what's not on it. But one thing that strikes me always is that, of course, this is four years after the, the, the founding of Tel Aviv. But Tel Aviv's not there, but you, you actually have uh, Sorona there on the map above Yaffa, which was the Templar settlement there. So I think looking at that, that really already shows us there's so much about this period that we miss, and there's so much more to do. Now, claiming the homeland. The, I'll go ahead and talk about the, some of the main arguments. Following the 1908 Young Turk Revolution, Palestinian, and Palestinians and Jews each began to transform into political communities, forming distinct local identities and realizing concrete steps to what I call claiming their homeland. Palestinians during this period, I argue, come to see themselves as a community, community independent of Syria. The local Jewish community opts for separation from and not integration with the overall Palestinian population. By 1914, the minority Jewish community had become an independent actor, despite the growing protest of the Palestinian majority. And of course, this was all happening um, in the context of the Ottoman Empire. Now, this work rewrites the history of the area within the context of the late Ottoman period. And what I say, quote, does not read history backward by projecting the realities of today back in time. So what we can look at, and I, I really want to rethink this, you know, this narrative of, uh, of the, the first Aliyah and the second Aliyah and, and, you know, looking at the history this way, Balfour Declaration, it's almost as, as this was inevitable, but I'll come back to that, that point. So A, it challenges the Zionist narrative of Aliyot, the mass waves of migration. It demonstrates that to understand the collapse of the Palestinian society in 1948, one needs to go back to the Ottoman era. It was during this period they forged the first acts of resistance. And both Jews and Palestinians did not predict the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Now looking at Palestinian and Palestinian, what I call Palestinianism, understanding, understanding Palestinians not through the lens of the Jewish minority, but as a community that made 85% of the overall population they are an, an independent actor with a rich history. A unique Palestinian, I also argue, a unique Palestinian identity emerged during the late Ottoman era, and not just as a reaction to Zionism. One whole chapter, the Haram al-Sharif incident, which I wrote earlier, of course, highlights this. Also, the need to treat Palestine as, a, as independent of Syria, or what, quote, southern Syria, which seems to be much more as a result of the post-World War I realities. And then I argue that this does not regard the fact, this does not disregard the fact that they also had strong ties with Syrian Arabs. However, it was clear that they lived in Palestine and were increasingly referring to, referring to themselves as Palestinians. And here's a poem from the newspaper Philistine in 1914. You can, you know, you can find many different poems, and I think this is. Even, you know, there's so many different realms that we can look at that I think we need to reassess. But one thing is to, you know, for people doing literature to look at this poetry because it is in, in the newspapers during this period. Oh, Palestine, you have slept for so long. Oh, Palestine, your glory is withering away. Oh, my people, if we only knew our reality, reality we would weep and mourn over the loss of the land. Oh, my homeland, you have fallen into the hands of the enemy. You have been plundered and you are under the injustice of those who hate my land, save my homeland, my heart, spirit, and soul. So what I do in this book, I, I develop this term, which I don't think is, is, is my own invention, but I do definitely use it. And it's interesting that it comes out right, uh, you know, separate from knowing that Carol Hakim had wrote her book on Lebanism also. Um, and I think that's something very important to look at these local identities. And it's not by chance that we do now have scholarship on Lebanism, which I, which I think we should do the same thing with uh, Palestine, with Palestinianism. So Palestinianism, I, Palestinianism, I define as um, denoting the essence of what it meant to be a Palestinian before the rise of nation state nationalism, when in the late Ottoman era, a modern notion of patriotism 
to Palestine began to be expressed among the Arab population. Um, it acted within one's identification as an Ottoman, Arab, Muslim, or Christian. Understanding of a homeland resonated at different levels, I argue. Urban notables, new educated elite, village leaders, peasants, it was an interchange of ideas between all these groups. And by 1914, terms like Palestinian, 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 I can't say this, Palestinian, Palestinian people and people of Palestine. So we see Palestine, Palestinian, Shab al Palestine, Ahl Palestine. We see this 1913, 1914, we see this more and more. Now I take this um, beer commercial as uh, uh, you know, advertisement from Palestine as something um, where we can learn about local identities also. Because at the very end of it, besides it being a really nice cool drink to cool you down um, in the summertime, and besides it, I think it's really interesting the fact that, that um, you, know, you see quite a bit uh, during this period, quite a bit of um, advertisements of alcohol. And on the same page can be Raga uh, al talking about you know, giving a religious sermon. That's interesting in itself. But at the very bottom, I use this as um, looking, the, it says Yusuf Alina il Wakila Amumi la Palestine was surreal. So I use this as an example that, you know, I think years later this has become, it became controversial or some people denying the existence of Palestine, that we just need to find simple understandings of, of Palestine being separate from Syria here. Okay, and that's why, why I use this. Um, I think for the people reading this, now what is the, what it, where, where do these borders start and where do they stop? This, this could be, this could provide a, a interesting uh, discussion. But overall, people there knew that they were living in a place called Palestine. Of course, the newspaper is Palestine also. Let's, let's, let's add that point, obviously. And then I also use this um, letterhead from the chief uh, rabbinate in uh, the Holy Land, Jerusalem. And here they actually translate the, what they have in the Hebrew. Um, if you see my cursor, Be'eretz HaKodesh in the Holy Land, they translate this to Philistine. I thought that that's one of the rare, rare moments where we see exact translation, that if they have to translate Eretz HaKodesh or, or, or Eretz Yisrael into, into Arabic from Hebrew, that they're going to translate it to Palestine. So we're talking about the same land. We're talking about the same imagined um, area. Um, of course, here we see Haham Basha, chief rabbi of Palestine, with Jimmy at Taif Israeli, Sfaradim Bakud Sharif. What's interesting here, and we, 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 this is something well known already, that um, I think specifically the, 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 in the sphere of Palestine, Palestinian Arabic refused to Jews as Israeli. Um, the children, and this comes from, of course, the children of Israel, Bani Israel, that you see this in other places, um, in the Ottomans. But this is something I think very unique to Palestine. Also. It's in the Quran. It's yeah, absolutely. It's in the Quran. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think in the modern period, you're going to see a much more. If if you see newspapers in Syria, for example, it's much more likely that they'll call them Yahud. Um, mm. In Palestine, um, you see numerous colonial Israeli, for example. That's when, of course, Jews didn't define themselves as, as this way. But here in the translation, we see it. It's consistent, and, and, they, and we know what, uh, everyone knows what they're talking about. Now, Palestine's Jewish community during this um, period, I argue, does not define themselves as Palestinian Jews. And later on, we can talk about that. I finished a new paper um, on Arab Jews in Palestine and, and arguing that they did not define themselves as Palestinian, even if they define themselves as Arab Jew, and we can come back to that, but it they, but rather refer to themselves as a Jewish community in Palestine, or or of course the Jewish Yeshuv. Defining Palestine's Jewish community is a difficult task. You have Ashkenazi, Sephardi immig immigrants from Eastern Europe, Arab lands, Balkans, North Africa, Yiddish, Russian, uh, Russian uh, speaking different languages, Yiddish, Russian, Ladino, and multiple dialects of Arabic and Persian. Following the 1908 Young Turk, Re Turk Revolution, this hodgepodge of communities begin to unite under the banner of adopting Hebrew as their mother tongue. Already, all the newspapers were in Hebrew, 
and they are now currently online, um, as well as Palestine and uh, uh, Quds Sharif, which is at, at Columbia's Palestine Center. The adopting of Hebrew connects Zionist and anti-Zionist into one group. And I think that's something that uh, we can ponder on and think more about. Um, meaning that the Hebrew speaking community um, included um, anti-Zionist and anti-Zionism then is not what anti-Zionism is in the 1920s, 30s or what it is today. I also look at the Jewish community, um, how they adopt Ottoman patriotism. And this is what I call they, they opted for separation through integration. Um, which was common among other non-Muslim groups and inherently um, um, connected to the spread of Hebrew as a dominant language of the Yeshu. In order to separate and become an autonomous community, they actually had to integrate and adopt this Ottoman patriotism. Um, local Zionism emerges not just in Jerusalem, but also in Istanbul and other cities throughout the empire. Youth, the youth were, were really attracted by this idea of Zionism, and Ottoman Jewish politicians in Istanbul were influenced by it as well. Next, I'll, I'll, I look at how the Israeli historical narrative has written out the history of Ottoman Zionism over focusing on the contributions of small groups of the second Aliyah. So even with this next paper I did on, on the Arab Jews, um, I really think this, this whole period needs to be rethought out. And I actually argue that for the most part, people did not know the members of the second Aliyah during this period. Who mattered? It was the children of um, Moroccan immigrants coming in the late um, 19th century, and also the children of the, uh, from the, from the first immigrants and what they would call the first Aliyah. And that's where I argue for Ottoman history that, we, that I call it re renegotiating the Millet system. Following the 1908 Young Turk Revolution, a euphoric response of a, of a new, I have to move my, a new era um, occurs. Jewish Christians and Muslims celebrated together in Jerusalem, as well in Istanbul and other cities throughout the empire. This book challenges the nostalgic descriptions of intercommunal relations, however, much found in the press. It does not discredit prevalent work showing, inter, showing these relations but uses their work as a launching point. Um, so what I argue and look at, at freedom, Hurriyet, and equality, Musavet, was not a horizontal type of equality, but one that provided an equal playing field for the different groups. The Young Turks transfers, transfer uh, powers during this period to a secular elite in Istanbul, where each community would now re renegotiate demands vis-a-vis -vis this new bureaucratic elite. The Ottoman Jewish community, community, whether in Palestine or in Istanbul, was using other non-Muslim communities as a model to receive autonom autonom autonomous rights. Quote, here's uh, from Ottoman and Ottoman Armenian parliamentarian, quote, freedom of language more than, more than anything will show the people of the empire that the Ottoman flag is the best shelter for their national freedom. And this feeling will unite everyone together and will link everyone with the greatest patriotism to the Ottoman homeland and will enlighten everyone together to love the flag and always defend it. So uh, actually, uh, and it's at this point that I, this is where I, where I argue, um, one second here, I just wanna, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on two or three more points after this. But I, I think this renegotiation the Millet system actually placed Jews and Palestinians in competition. And where Palestinians are not a Millet by no means, it does place Muslims and Christians together competing against the Jewish community that through their Ottomanism is actually receiving uh, more and more autonomy. And I think this is key in understanding what I call claiming the homeland. Now claiming the homeland, it's divided in four chapters, two in Palestinian and two on the Jewish community. Um, I'll argue, I'll, I'll focus a, uh, just a few minutes on the, the collective Palestinian identity that I work on. By, my, by 1914, there was a common bond among many Palestinians, regardless of their social and religious affiliations, and that they were uniting to confront issues such as the continued Jewish migration 
British imperialism. Very importantly, I think that almost everyone's missed Palestinian immigration, Palestinians leaving the land, and the poor state of the peasants. For, for Palestinians, Im immigration was no less a worry than the immigration of Jews were. Palestinian voices emerged through the local press, Ottoman petitions um, emerging from also peasants, muqtars, and notables, from university students in Cairo and Istanbul, and politicians campaigning for the, the parliament. And we, 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 we know about through, originally I found in my dissertation that was it is brought to the book, is that you have something called the Philistine Gengelary, Shabab al Palestine, uh, which is uh, groups in um, Cairo, Istanbul, and Beirut. And these seem to be university students that are uniting, which is interesting because we see this across the Ottoman, um, across the board in Istanbul, you had numerous groups, including the, the Ottoman Hebrew Student Union that was founded by, by David Ben Gurion and God from Kenya. Now, um, I'm not going to spend too much. Uh, of course, uh, you know about this, Rashid, about the Haram al-Sharif incident. Um, but I think through looking at this incident and this archaeological dig, this treasure hunt, we see what's most important is that a, an event that unites Palestinians that really has nothing to do with the Jewish community. And I think that is something uh, central here. Now, in Palestine and Jewish community, um, what I argue is that claiming the homeland was not only in um, being done in uh, Palestine, but also through lobbying uh, in Istanbul. And this is really interesting because it's it sort of, you know, when Moshe Shered, who also was a uh, dedicated Ottoman soldier, when the war ends and it's clear that the British are going to rule Palestine, he only makes one trip back to Istanbul, and that's to get his grades, and he takes his grades to London. And he says, now London is the place that we're going to have to work. But I think that's something really important that, you know, lobbying already takes place in Istanbul through a newspaper network and through, through uh, students studying there. I also look at a son of the, the first Aliyah, um, the first uh, Jewish officer in the Ottoman army. He's the son of Aaron Eisenberg, of, the founder of uh, Rehovot. Um, and he joins the army, ends up POW, um, and dies before the exchange takes place, is memorialized both in Turkey as, as dying for the homeland and also within the, um, the memorial of, um, the, uh, of Israel also. Um, so it's interesting to see um, his ideas. Now, his brother-in-law, God Frumkin, is um, uh, also in Istanbul. And he was, I mean, Carmi was motivated by this. He becomes a, already a war hero in the Balkan Wars and, you know, fluent in Ottoman Turkish, of course, Arabic, Hebrew. Um, his first language is uh, Hebrew. Um, what's interesting is that God from, um, writes in his memoirs that a Carmi had, and this is, I think, very, very important. You can't do much, too much with it. But the idea was that Carmi was asked, well, why are they buying, why is the Zionist movement buying land in Syria? And Carmi said that would be a great place to um, uh, resettle Palestinians uh, in a land. Um, once um, we purchase a land and, and the peasants are expelled, well, the land is better in Syria and fertile, then maybe it would be an idea to transfer them there. So I think it's the very first time that we even hear this idea of transfer. Now, this is hearsay. This is written by his, his brother-in-law um, years later. But I think that's something interesting, and it's maybe not surprising, being that Carmi fought in the Balkan Wars also. He was very aware of, of population transfers uh, during this period. Now, um, I'm not going to go too much into this, but I hear the, here's the part about uh, Istanbul. And um, I'll argue, I, I look at this, I say a sharp rise in anti-Semitism, the capital leads to an ironic case where Turkish politicians adopt a conspiracy theories, countering the Palestinian MPs anti-Jewish immigration to Palestine. So this is interesting that it's Ruhi al-Khaladi and Saeed al-Husseini who are siding with the CUP against the anti-Zionist movement in Istanbul, a great deal that's very, very highly anti-Semitic. 
And this, and this is ironic, but this also weakens the case of the Palestinians. I mean, the Palestinians, when they, when they lobby in the parliament, their, their CUP party is not actually the ones that are staunch anti-Zionists. In fact, we know that the CUP had you know, minimal relations and sometimes good relations with individual clients. So I think that's something um, we need to look at. And I, I, my next paper, I look at that's the, really what I want to do is to look at that issue. What are the relations between the CUP and the local, the local Palestinians? Now, uh, concluding remarks um, quickly. Palestinians as Ottoman citizens, uh, uh, as Ottoman citizens, adopt a civic approach to protest. Palestinians transform a local identity into a viable political community, inherently Arab and Ottoman. The Jewish community created new ties with Istanbul and used other non-Muslim emerging nationalisms as an example of how they gain prestige. Important trends during this period, we can look at landless peasant class starts during this period. Only in 1930 and 36 does it completely erupt. The first attempts by Palestinians to set up an, organ an organization similar to the Jewish National Fund actually happens in 1910 and 11. Nine, I think 19, excuse me, 1912, they actually start discussing, let's unite together and purchase land in the name of the Palestinian people. That way, the, the Zionist movement won't be able to, to buy it. Um, the Palestinians show, show desperation towards the end, begin to exaggerate numbers of immigrants. However, they agree that the ones that have arrived would be able to stay. The last thing, um, very last thing, the case of, we have a case of two universities being established, one Jewish and one Arab that highlight the, the divide. So there is at this time, a Palestinians are talking about establishing a university that's going to actually compete even with El Azhar. And it's gonna bring people from the whole regions and strengthen their hold on Palestine through this university. Importantly, it would not only be an Islamic kuliyeh, but also a modern university. And this is right when the Jewish community is purchase, purchasing land for the Hebrew universe. Land, uh, Zionists came to Istanbul and lobbied on behalf of their political agenda. We talked about Moshe Shevet already. Um, very importantly, anti-Zionism of Albert Entebbe and the chief rabbi Chaim Nachum was not anti-Jewish immigration. I think that's where we completely confuse things here. Um, often they worked for uh, the Zionist movement or no, they benefit the Zionist movement through their work. And we know that the newspaper Palestine is closed down by Chaim Nachum's lobbying in Istanbul against um, um, what, you know, what he claimed was you know, anti-Semitism in the newspaper of Palestine. And then the last Zionist debate in Istanbul had more to do with the Jewish question than it did to have, than it actually was one over Palestine. Meaning the debate that I looked at really was much more about the future of the Jewish community, very similar to the debates on the future of the Armenian communities or the Greek community in Istanbul. So I'll go ahead and stop there. I hope it wasn't too much, but it should give you a good idea of, of the book. Uh, you're muted. I've been doing this for more than a year and I still have to remember to unmute myself. Um, thank you very much, Louis. That was really a, a very, uh, I think, thorough, brief, but thorough um, expose of some of the main ideas in the book. Uh, I, really, I really only have a couple things to th say. The first thing that I wanna say is that I think this book and some other scholarship that deals with this period uh, takes seriously the fact that you cannot look at least at this period, the period up to 1918, and you, you cover up to 1914, but the period till the end of the Ottoman era, um, through the lens of a nationalist silo. In other words, you can't just say, this is Palestinian history seen in terms of the Palestinian present, or this is the history of Zionism or Israel seen through the lens of nationalist historiography. This has to be seen in terms of Ottoman history. This is, this is, this is, People didn't know where things were going to go in 1914 or 1917. Um, they, they did not know that there would be an Israel. They did not know there would be a Nakba. They did not know, um, some of them wanted, had aspirations for things that 
worked out or had fears about things that later worked out. Um, mm -hmm. We see people like I said, I said, the editor of, of Palestine writing things before 1914, which indicate his fears. And we see Herzl in his diaries and we see Ben Gurion in his diaries writing things in the pre-World War I period that indicate some of their hopes and some of their aspirations. But people were operating in terms, at least up until the war, up until World War I, in terms of a reality which they assumed, as you mentioned in your talk, would continue to be stable. The Ottoman Empire had been shaken by the Balkan Wars, by the Libyan War and by the Balkan Wars, but most people living there at the time assumed that the structure that had been there for 20 generations was likely to continue. And so they saw their future in terms of an Ottoman framework, uh, whether they were working for autonomy as Arabs or whether they were working for autonomy as Zionists or as Jews. And in some cases you had non-Zionist Jews who felt that Jews should have a degree of autonomy without believing in, in separatism and nationalism. Uh, you had others who were Zionists and who wanted a Jewish state but who understood that you could not do that in the context of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire had too many separatist movements for the central government to ever accept complete separation. You had had uh, time and time again in the Balkans and increasingly in Armenia, and then more and more in the Arab provinces, calls for autonomy, which developed into calls for separatism, which developed into calls for independence, starting with the Greek what the Greeks call the Greek War of Independence and continuing right up through World War I. So everybody operated within an Ottoman context, which even though it was challenged, I think most people assumed would continue. And that means we cannot take the mindset of 2021 or of 1921 for that matter and use it to try and understand what's happening in 1912 or 1913. And I think that's one of the most important things that your book does it really places this deeply, firmly in the Ottoman context. I think other books uh, which cover this period try to do so, and some of them are more or less successful, but I think your book is, is frankly one of the most successful uh, in, this, in this regard. By the way, I think that 1914 poem mm -hmm. which you quote on a yes. poem, it might've been written by Isa Isa, because he later on came to have a reputation as a poet. Now, whether he wrote this one there could have been any other number of authors. Mm -hmm. I'm just guessing. And I actually think that someone who wrote uh, a book based, which is Noha uh, uh, Kharaf, who is actually Isa Isa's granddaughter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, might be able to tell us about that poem because she's very familiar with his poetry. In any case, a couple of other uh, points, a, a more general point uh, about, about uh, based on what I've just said. Uh, which how important it is not to read pre-1914 history, not just in the Ottoman context, but more generally, uh, not in terms of what happened later, of the inevitability of that. Nothing was inevitable in 1914. Many other things could have happened differently. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we, we, we have especially seen the pre-1914 period enfolded into Zionist historiography and the historiography of Israel as being the inevitable forerunners. And I think you're right in saying, we can't see this in terms of the Aliyah. We can't see this in terms of the first Aliyah be, uh, being the most important event in the 1880s. And it's not, it's, it's a minor event in the history of this country. Uh, it becomes more important uh, in hindsight, but at the time it had a limited importance, which has to be understood. The same is true of the second Aliyah. However important it was to the development of Zionism, however important it was to the development of forms of colonization, however important it was to the social systems that ended up being adopted to the politics of the Yishuv, it was, you know, micro history in terms of the broader uh, scheme of things in Palestine before 1914. And the same is true with all of the things that one can point to on the Palestinian side. Um, they have to be seen in terms of a much broader context, the context of the Ottoman Empire, the context of developing uh, development of Arabism, of relationships between different parts of the Arab world with one another, and then local histories uh, where identity was not always the most important issue. And the idea of Palestine and Palestinian ad identity was one of multiple overlapping identities, uh, as with Jews, uh, mm -hmm. so with Palestinians. And I think you very clearly uh, 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 lay this out. Um, one other thing that I think you, is, is very, very useful 
is the way in which you lay out differences between groups within the Jewish community, within the issue. Uh, the degree to which large numbers of people paid no attention to Zionism. I mean, most religious Jews paid no attention whatsoever to Zionism. They were not against Jewish immigration, as you correctly point out. In fact, they favored Jewish immigration. Mm -hmm. they, had no, they had not only no problem with it, to them it was a good thing, but not for a nationalist objective, not in terms of Zionism, because you know it was good for Jews to come to the, to the land because of the ancestral connection with it, because of the religious connection, to pray, to die, whatever it may be, to live, mm -hmm. but um, not necessarily with a nationalist objective. Obviously, for the Zionists, that was the objective. Um, and, and what is true of immigration is true of so many other issues, uh, land purchase and so on and so forth. Um, and I think you're absolutely right in talking about the importance of language. And I, it's fascinating, as the book shows, that language reform, the nahda, the change in the importance of Arabic to Arabic speakers in the decades leading up to this period that you, you talk about, the Ottoman constitutional mm -hmm. period between 1908 and 1914, is seen as a model uh, by many Zionists. Not because there hadn't been a similar phenomenon to the Nahda, the Haskala. You had had some kind of enlightenment revel, revival. But the focus on language, which, which, which people are seeing with Arabic, um, is something that inspires specifically a turn to Hebrew. I find that very, very interesting. Absolutely. Very few people, I think, have pointed that out. I, I don't know of anyone else, in fact, who has. Um, I, I, I could say other things, but um, we have already uh, uh, gone 45 minutes, and I see we, we already have one question. Uh, let me just conclude my own, my own remarks um, before we take questions. And I, I will, I will uh, uh, please, if you have questions, uh, write them in the Q&A, and I will read them to Professor Fishman, and he can then answer them. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I want to say uh, is that most people write the history of this land entirely from a nationalist perspective. You can argue that since Hegel, all, all history, in the sense we understand it in the modern world, has been nationalist history, mm -hmm. history of nations. So this is not just true of Israeli histories or histories of Israel and Zionism or Palestinian histories or histories of Palestine. It's true of history generally. It's, it's written most frequently or has been written most frequently in a nationalist context. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps we're moving away with, from this with histories of science, histories of technology, social history, uh, histories of climate, uh, perhaps. But I think the national silo is still very powerful in the writing of history. Um, and very rare are the historians who, while paying the proper attention to the national element, which you can't ignore. I mean, mm -hmm. since the 19th century, you cannot ignore nationalism or the nation. Um, understand that you have to write somehow the history of the land. Uh, there's the, one, of the, one of the few uh, attempts to do this was a, a book by Ilan Pape, uh, which I, I myself think was only partially successful. I'm trying to pull it off the, the bookshelves here. It's called A History of Modern Palestine. Mm -hmm. And Pape chooses to describe this single land. He says, this is one country. And we have to understand its history in, 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 as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, he chooses to call it Palestine rather than Palestine, Israel, or Israel. Um, and whether this, this book is successful or not, I think that, that it, 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 it points to something that I think we're going to have to think in terms of more and more, which is the degree to which these histories are imbricated. Whether you see it through a settler colonial lens or whether you see it through a national lens, you cannot write the history of the one without at least having some understanding of the history of the other. Um, the Holocaust is a crucial event in Palestinian history. The arrival of Hitler in power is a crucial event in Palestinian history. It's German history or it's Jewish history but it's also Palestinian history. What happens in the 1930s, even before the Holocaust, even before the, the process of extermination is decided upon, has a massive influence on Palestinian history, which means it's one, you have to understand these things in relation to one another. You can't say, this is Palestinian history, this is Jewish or Israeli or Zionist history. There is some ways in which, obviously, um, there has been a preponderance of writing uh, from one perspective uh, in the past. And I think that's now changing. Um, but to some extent, 
uh, that writing is, is also in the historical uh, national, I should say, silo. And one of the great merits, I think, of this book is that you're trying to look at this country as, as a single unit, um, you, it, while at the same time respecting the fact that you have these national histories within it, or what become later mm -hmm. on national histories. And you're very careful to argue that in neither case do we already have full-blown nationalism. Yes, you have Zionism, but most Jews in Palestine are not Zionists. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have an idea of Palestine, but most Palestinians don't think of a Palestinian unit for their national identity. They still think of themselves, in both cases, as Ottomans. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the merit uh, of this book. Um, let us now see if, um, if um, we can go to the questions. Let me bring up the questions, and I'm going to ask them to you. Uh, you don't have to look Perfect. at them. If you want to, you can also. I'll read them okay. uh, for the audience. Um, the first question is uh, from an, another uh, former student, Anne Arfan, Dr. Anne Arfan, actually. Um, who's, who's just finished a book on, on Anurwa, a very interesting book on Anurwa. Uh, she says, thank you for this interesting talk. Looking forward to reading the book. I have two questions. Could you expand on the self-identification of Jews in Palestine in terms of seeing themselves, or some of them, seeing themselves as perhaps Arab, but not Palestinian? That's the first question. And the second is a more specific uh, question. Uh, uh, do you know the date of the chief rabbi's letterhead that you shared? Perfect. So um, the, the first one is uh, quite, I'll, I'll start with the second question. The date is around 1911, 1912. And if you want to shoot me an email, I can, uh, louisfishman at gmail.com. I mean, I'd be happily uh, happy to send it to you, a clip of it or the date if you need it. Um, the second question about the self-identification of, of Arab Jews. What, what does, I, I actually, my book, I, I look at, you know, two or three people that have been looked at by three or four scholars. Um, that's Nisim Malul and Shimon Moyal and Esther Moyal and, and groups that were, um, which have seen and have been seen until now as, as serving as a possible bridge between Palestinians and the Jewish community. And what I argue in this paper is that their experiences of out, outside of Palestine is really what shaped them. And that was, their experiences in Cairo or in Beirut, where they were able to actually create, I think, um, very strong relations um, uh, with the local population as Arab Jews, writing in newspapers like El Haram, different things, different, uh, different uh, newspapers. What I see though the mistake is when people look at them in Palestine was that they were avid Zionists. And that Zionism was Ottoman, Ottoman Zionism, but that's, that's the same Zionism that Carmi Effendi, um, the soldier, the Ashkenazi soldier had. And that was to connect their ties with Istanbul. I mean, what I see is that in different, um, in a very, very different way than other cities, Jerusalem is really, really connected to Istanbul. Not as much as, let's say, Baghdad and, and Damascus, and definitely not, of course, Cairo. And this interchange between what I'm finding is a very fascinating. Um, going back and forth of uh, the Sephardic community to, to, to Egypt also. So what I'm thinking is, is that the civic identity of Egypt for Egyptians during this period, they took this idea as Egypt for the Egyptians, or we all are Ottomans, and we have this shared homeland. Um, and they tried to make it work in Palestine. And what happened was, is that the Palestinians clearly see them as, as Zionists and as um, competing with them um, in Istanbul for what I call claiming the homeland. So yes, they see themselves, um, and there are, I think, a few places where they even could, might even, might even call themselves Palestine. But it was really clear during this period that what's happening in Palestine is not what ha what's happening in Cairo or in Baghdad, where the local Jewish community is actually integrating within the greater Arab community. And that is because of that is because of, free, of the language of Hebrew. So yes, Nisa Malul and 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 uh, Shimon Moyal, there's there's quite a few others. Um, I really wanted to serve as let's say as a bridge, I would say, but uh, they weren't willing to for a second, I think, to forfeit the fact that the Jewish community would be a Hebrew-speaking community, 
And what I find is that quite a few of them mentioned in the newspaper articles is that there's not enough Arabic speakers among Jews for a Jewish newspaper, for an Arabic newspaper. So let me go back and say that the argument over the voice of the bottom in South of Osmania, when I, you know, there's a, a Arabic newspaper edited by uh, Jews, I argue that this is a paper written by Jews for Arabs, not for Jewish readership. And they actually look at Istanbul as a model, as the, the Zionist newspaper network in, in, in Istanbul that was in French and, and, and uh, was mostly in French, was the idea that they were able to, to shift. I mean, what, and perhaps a tragedy is, is that with the ones that defined themselves as Arab Jews in Palestine, they were convinced that they were, they would, they, if they just proved to the Palestinians that there was really, you know, that they were there to bring, uh, let's say, economic benefit to everyone. And the Palestinians are not buying it during this period. And I think that's, you know, what, what, what I found in the book was, I think was, I was so, I was surprised by this. That yes, there were Palestinians, some politicians that said, you know what, um, the Zionists are actually bringing economic benefits, profit, everything. But by 1913, 14, you have this coalition of peasants or, or the, the new landless peasant class. You have a, a group of Mukhtars saying, wait a minute, if we don't have people in our village, what is our importance going to be? And then we have the urban folks also. So we have this really coalition of Arabs, whether the Muslims and Christians, coming together. Now, the same Arab Jews all in here used to, would, would write obsessively that anti-Zionism was really anti-Semitism by the Christian editors. This is something that's over and over repeated. Isa al Isa was an anti-Semite. They were anti-Semitic. The problem here is, is that the Muslims were saying the exact same things. They were saying it in petitions. They were saying it in the parliament. And really, that's why they started what they called a war on the press. And I think that's something important that where you have the conquest of labor by the socialist Zionists, social Zionists, social Zionists, second Aliyah, and where you have the conquest of land by the Zionist movement, the Arabic speaking Jews, a group of them, talked about a conquest of the press. And that was their role in this. So that's what I'm, I'm looking at now. Um, very quick comment. Um, one of the things that I think you bring up here uh, with the, with the uh, attempt to establish Arabic language newspapers, Mm -hmm. and with the success of French language newspapers, Zionist newspapers mm -hmm. in, in Istanbul. And it's, I think, an underappreciated aspect of Zionism is the extent to which it was understood that the success of the movement was hinged on proselytization and not just among Jews. Uh, they were talking in French, obviously, to Ottoman Jews, but they were also talking to non-Jewish French speakers in Istanbul. Uh, uh, you have people like Ben-Gurion uh, and Yitzhak Ben-Zvi coming to the United States after they leave Turkey in 1916 and spending years building up the Zionist organization here, but also doing propaganda, Hasbara. I mean, the, the, yeah. the most underappreciated aspect of Zionism, people talk about uh, uh, the, the land, control of the land, settlement, immigration. People talk about money and, 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 and the, the ability to, to mobilize financial resources. I don't think anybody gives sufficient attention to the fact that these were Eastern Europeans who understood propaganda, you know, from the time of the anarchist Kropotkin, from the time of the socialist, from the time of all of the movements that they were familiar with in Eastern Europe, proselytization was crucial uh, to, to the success of these political movements. And these people were Eastern European Jews who came from a political culture where you would win or lose, depending not just on how well you organized and money and so forth and so forth, so on, but how well you could spread your ideas. And it was one of the, great, agree, success, one of the yeah. great successes of Zionism from the beginning that there is a focus on this. And that's one reason you have this incredibly sophisticated uh, uh, information propaganda Hasbara uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, project in the 21st century, because the, the, these people were at it for 130 years. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many questions. So maybe you can make your answers a little shorter. We have about yeah, an hour. Um, a second question from another Another specialist, uh, uh, Dr. Roberto Mazza, he says, Louis, 
you've taken into account local issues, Jewish and Arab, you looked at the Ottoman context, but I was wondering to what extent debates within and between the various Zionist movements and agents had an impact on local relations between Arab and Jew, Arabs and Jews in the last few years of Ottoman rule? So maybe a quick answer to that one. It's a complicated question, but. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, thanks so much, uh, Roberto, for the, for the question. Um, I, I'll just say that what I, I think the strength of, and this I, I think I understood after the book was, I had finished the book and I had written this other article, was that the strength of the Zionist movement was that there were numerous groups and nu nu numerous autonomous groups. So each one worked, to, they worked together in unison, but they were very, very separate. So the idea was, I, I don't think they're overall, a, even defining, of course, you know, you write you know, what was extended between the various Zionist movements and agents had an impact on local relations between Arab, Arabs and Jews. I think it's, it's important to look at because the, the movement was so autonomous that people were able to develop independently and as or in, within the organiz different organizations relations with Arabs. So, you know, I, I look at Eliezer Ben Yehuda, you know, we've been looking so much at recently about the, the, the Arab Jews, but then we get, of course, the idea that it's Eliezer Ben Yehuda who is meeting weekly or, or monthly with Ruhi al Khalidi to, to understand, to understand uh, better what the local population thinks of. And it's actually Eliezer Ben Yehuda and at, the, at the breakout of World War I who, who brings Arabs, she sits and brings Jews and Arabs together. And when the, the Arabic speaking, the, the Jewish population said, wow, this is, um, a, this is the first time this has happened, Jews and Arabs coming together and speaking. So it, it was El, El Maliach said this. So I think that's, I think that's the, I'll, I'll just sum up by saying that I don't think there was one, ever one policy, what is, you know, the relations are supposed to be between Jews and Arabs. What there was were there many autonomous groups and organizations, all interactingly different. Um, and the fact is that they didn't, because they didn't know that empire is going to fall, I think it was encouraged also. You know, if you can, if you can strengthen relations, and the more the merrier, I would say. Um, there's a question that disappeared and just came back by Yair Sporai, uh, friend of the center. Um, he says, thank you so much for this great discussion. Could you please talk a little about Arthur Lupin and his role, especially in the context of Ottoman rule uh, over Palestine? I know Lupin plays a big role later on as well, but um, if you want to say a little bit about his role in this period. Yeah, um, a, actually to tell the truth, he comes up in my book quite a few times. What I think his role is, is that he was able to convince the Ottoman administration that Zionism was a uh, modernist movement that was gonna bring progress to Palestine. And he did that in a, in a, in a, a very good way because we know that he, he met with the Ottoman. You know, I think that's something we didn't talk about was the Zionist ability actually the official Zionist organization we're talking about, ability on the ground in Palestine to develop relations with the local governors in Jerusalem. And, you know, they're visiting, for example, Mikveh Israel, the school, which to them was not a Zionist school whatsoever. And in fact, it, 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 was, it was a subgroup of the, of the Alliance Israelite that had a sister school near Izmir, yeah. or Yehuda, the first or Yehuda, was three hours from Izmir. So this was a Jewish farming school. So I think what, what Rupin was able to do was a um, really, when, when I use his, his, his work in my, in, in my book, is I, I, don't, I don't come across him so much, but I use some of his work and his studies of, of the Jewish society there and the Arab society there. Um, so I think it's, it, it's important that, that uh, his importance was yes, um, creating ties, but also uh, creating ties with the local Jewish community and showing that Zionism really didn't stand counter to the, their future in Palestine. And I think that was his um, very important uh, contribution to the movement. Um, we have a question from someone who wants to ask her question, but before we get to that, um, uh, Yara Masri uh, asks, 
do you mind elaborating on the 1911 Hanam Sharif incident and how it relates to British response and the future state of Jordan? Um, so maybe say a little bit more about the Hanam Sharif incident uh, and, 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 and the British archaeology that sparks it. Because mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. many people know about that. I think your book is one of the few, there are a couple of articles that touch on it. Your book is one yeah, of the what's, few. What's really interesting is that you have like three or four, well, one or two books coming out about it right now, um, historical novels, different things. It's a great story. It's sort of like the Indiana Jones story. And in fact, a lot of people think Indiana Jones was based on this story. And we found a few hints that this is the case. But basically, when I was in the Ottoman Empire, I come across a dossier that was about 150 pages. It was fascinating. And it was about an archaeological dig. And I said to myself, how is this archaeological dig? You know, what happens is uh, once uh, Captain Parker reaches Palestine, cuts a deal in audit with the Ottoman administration in Istanbul, he comes to Palestine, digs a tunnel. Now, all the archaeologists know about the Parker tunnels, which is really, really interesting. But the historians didn't know about the event itself. And what happens in the spring of 1911, really right when the newspaper of Palestine starts just months before that, um, is uh, Captain Parker digs, goes into the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, and digs straight down, and it's caught. And basically, um, when Palestinians return from the Nabi Musa pilgrimage, it sparks a riot in, in, in the city because they believe that treasures from under the, 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 the uh, Temple Mount uh, were stolen. Um, and this unites everyone together, I think, in a way that we've never seen before. The Ottoman authorities already in, before uh, in 1907 said that we might have to worry about local um, resistance to our rule. It's, it, they, 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 they hint around about this already in 1907, but they need to send troops and to Jerusalem to calm the, the calm it down. And so for me, it's interesting that this had nothing to do with the Jewish community because we always see um, tensions vis-a-vis -vis Jews and Arabs over the, uh, over the holy sites. Um, here was about um, uh, the British. Now, the main frustration of the Palestinians was actually directed to the Ottoman authorities. And I think that's something key um, that we need, to, we need to look at. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge, remember that most, most things in the Ottoman archives are three or four pages. This is 150 pages. And I only found it because there's two or three documents from Gaza that talk about them worrying that Zionists are coming here to take some archeological um, artifacts. Now, I think they just put that in there to bring attention to their, to their cause. Um, I don't think that was, it was never really, Zionism was never really a part of this. So uh, yeah, it's it's something huge. Now with the state of Jordan, I, I think that's it's still way too early to to connect it to that, but 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 most definitely that memory. And I remember um, uh, when me and Professor Khalidi were talking about this uh, years and years ago when they first found it. I think you had mentioned you said, "Oh, that's what my my elders and my family were talking about a, a treasure hunt, or they took the treasures." It turns out that everyone knew about this. It was huge. It, it's in newspapers in London and New York and all over Istanbul and all over Palestine. A, a group from India come on a special mission to check it. But who didn't know about it? None of the historians had ever looked at it because it wasn't related to the Jewish Arab conflict. And that's where I argue that we really need to look for other things. I'm sure there's I, many more things like that in Palestine. I, tried, I try in Palestinian identity to talk about the fact that one of the elements of Palestinian identity is concern about the holy places on the part mm -hmm. of locals, Palestinians, or people who come later to see themselves as Palestinians, um, in terms of Western powers. Um, so Sheikh Ibn Khalidi establishes these uh, these Oqaf in the 18th century uh, in order to protect Jerusalem from the possibility of the Crusaders coming back. Uh, and these, including the Allen B. Barracks today, which is possibly a site of the U.S. Embassy, is one of these places that he that he creates as Al-Qaf in the outskirts of Jerusalem, saying, I, I want to create them as, 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 as permanent uh, religious endowments in order to protect them from the possibility of these Western powers coming back. Uh, same thing happens at the time of Napoleon. And this has nothing to, this is before Zionism is, you know, twinkle in anybody's eye. 
Uh, it has nothing mm. to do with Jews and Arabs. This has to do with fear of you know external control by the great powers of the holy places. Um, yeah, we have yeah, a question. That, we, Sorry, we, we see that we, we see that absolutely with British imperialism. Exactly. I mean, and and I really think more and more needs to be done comparing Iraq to Palestine yeah. because it's those places where the British have their eye on on the on the, and on Egypt, the area actually. And yeah, that. exactly. Um, and that that really needs to be done. Yeah. So we have someone who couldn't write a question in the chat, but wants to ask a question. Uh, Dorothy, can you okay. go ahead and ask your question, please? Are you with I'm us, so Dorothy? Appreciate. I really don't want to ask a question. I'm listening and I'm loving it. Okay, great. Let's go to the next question and thank you. Um, this is a question uh, uh, from Mohammed Sarhout who is a graduate student here at Columbia, born in New York to parents who immigrated from Jerusalem to the States. Uh, he wants to ask about something contemporary. A lot of Arabs in my grandfather's generation identified not as Palestinians, but as Ottomans who maintained their loyalty to the Sultan and the greater empire. Uh, I was wondering if you can comment about Palestinian and Syrian people's resurgent affinity for Turkey, specifically what potential might there be for a future political resolution that includes Turkey now, well, and secondly, what will change regionally as Arab governments give up on Palestine and the Palestinian people grow closer to Turkey and rediscover their Ottoman affinity. I should say that several of my own, my father's generation, his older brothers, four of them, uh, served in the Ottoman army. That's one of them. Um, my uncle Hussein, uh, four of my uncles served in the Ottoman army and served to the end of the war. Um, the, the people talk about Arab nationalism, but they don't talk about Ottomanism and don't realize that until 1917, 1918, when it was clear that the Ottoman Empire was going to be defeated, most people in the Arab provinces remained loyal to the central state um, and fought. I mean, I had uncles who were wounded in 1918 fighting in the Ottoman army, an uncle. So there you are. Um, but I, I think Mohammed's question has to do with the present. And I don't know if you want to talk about that. You are an expert on Turkey as well. I know you've lived a long time there, uh, Louis, if you want yeah. to say something about that. Uh, very briefly, I, I think what a lot of people miss is that a, perhaps this might connect also, is that already during this period, the Ottomans have a certain affinity towards Palestine, Ars of Palestine. And that you know, love of the land, of the holy land. You know, I, I always tell my students that, you know, they always say there's three holy sites. The first one's Mecca, then Medina, then Jerusalem. But I said with holy sites, not one is not more holy than the other. They're all holy sites. And the Ottomans uh, revered Jerusalem. So I think, uh, and, I, and I do, I write a lot about this uh, topic and it, it really gets tied into Turkish relations with Israel, which I argue that Turkish influence in Palestine today is dependent on their relations with, with Israel, meaning um, they're able to influence the West, in the West Bank and Gaza definitely because of their relations with Israel. And what we see is that in, in a very strange way that Turkey doesn't boycott Israel either, or like in the past, some of the Arab countries did or did it. So um, that special love for Palestine, I think, you know, in, 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 in Turkey, uh, you can get Islamists and leftists all uniting together over this issue. Unfortunately, I'll say that um, often this gets mixed, which I already found in the Ottoman period, with this local anti-Semitism also. And I think that really, this really confuses matters. Now, I don't want to compare that era to this era, but I think you can draw a line throughout the century and up until today um, that, that, that there is a, a compelling argument to say that, yes, in the late Ottoman era and in Turkey all the way up today, they feel a special, I think, allegiance or a special responsibility to, to, to serve um, Palestinians or Palestine or, or find some kind of just solution. And, and it's more than the rhetoric. As we know the rhetoric, there's tons of rhetoric there. And we know that there's tons of political reasons that uh, Erdogan might be doing this, but there is a seed of truth that that it goes beyond just an electoral vote. There's something much more to it than that, and I and I think I would stop there right now because I could go on for for much longer. Thank you. I, I know you've written about this actually in Haaretz and elsewhere. Um, 
uh, another uh, a couple of a couple of compliments uh, from Khalil Gindi. Thanks for a great event. Congratulations on the book. Uh, somebody Rima Yes says the immigrants to South America were known as Turcos, which is true. Uh, they were not known as Syrians or Lebanese or Palestinians. They were known as Turcos, uh, and that's continued into the 20th century, actually, long after the yeah. Ottoman Empire was gone. Yeah, and I might use this. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Khaled, thanks so much for, for joining. And also for the question about the Turcos or the comment is uh, once again, this, you know, I, I was very confused at the beginning and the late Boutras Abulmani, uh, my, my BA professor, when I brought him on the documents and I kept on saying, they're talking about Jewish immigration. He said, no, they're talking about, they're talking about Palestinian immigration. They're just using Muhajira. And he says, immigration, you've completely mis misread this document. And what I found is that in every source in Palestine, in the Quds Sharif, in the documents, Palestinians are saying, it's not that just Jews are coming, but it's that we're leaving. And I think through this, we can, uh, we, we really need to rethink um, that A, it wasn't only Christians migrating, it was also Muslims migrating. And they're leaving, many of them are leaving their their, their 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 working they're ending up in cities and then they're going to the us or to south america so i think that should be always taken into consideration and it's been been really overlooked um by many of the scholars i would say which is i don't think we ever thought about this that they would be so aware of this but they are aware of this and it, it, yeah. it's one of their it tops their agenda after zionism i think um is, is this question of immigration yeah, I, I noticed it myself in the pre-1914 press. Um, and you now have these huge communities from all over Bilad al-Sham, obviously, not just from mm -hmm. Palestine, um, but particularly Palestinians in Chile, who form this monumentally large community, possibly one of the largest Palestinian communities outside the Middle East. Uh, and the people at the Centro de Estudios Arabes in Santiago, there's no census. But they say the mm -hmm. estimates of the size of the population range from about a quarter of a million to maybe as much as half a million people who mm -hmm. are descendants of people who come from the 1880s. It's not uh, the, the, the 1880s and 90s. Uh, some of them uh, more before the war, World War One, and more in the in the 20s and the 30s after the United States closes uh, the doors of immigration from the exactly. Middle East and ev everybody else who's not white and Aryan and Scandinavian oh. and English. Um, the 19, the, the, the Reed Johnson uh, immigration law of 1924. Um, uh, and and uh, the, the, the ones who came from Palestine had exactly the identities you're talking about. They set up a club and they set up a football team uh, named for Palestine <laughs> in the early 20s. So this identity- he, is, is I just found, yeah, I have a student working on this period the late Ottoman period, and he's going through Palestine, and apparently there was already a club of Palestinian notables in U.S., whether, I believe it was, of course, Detroit, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. but, but it was a club of notables from Palestine talking about Palestinian issues, so it's, both, it's, it's fascinating. Both of those things, the club and the football team, are still there in Santiago. The club, That's fascinating. The club is amazing. I have been there. It's, you know, 20 tennis courts, three Olympic pools. I don't know. This is a well-established wow. community. And the football team is one of the best football teams in Chile. No, no Palestinian players as far as- Yeah, I'm exactly. The, 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 the team, anyway. the roots of the team, yeah. Exactly. Uh, okay, this is an, from Thomas Cox. This is an important, extremely important topic. Thank you both. Can you tell us a little more about the absentee landlords living away from the lands they owned in Palestine who sold lands to the Zionists? Um, Louis, I've dealt with this, you've dealt with this in your work, please. You know, I think the, to the extent that they were able, Palestinian peasants, to understand that they were being sold out, they were quite aware of it from the, from the beginning. You see this in, in uh, you know, in the petitions to the Ottomans. And the petitions to the Ottomans, you know, they talk about them being there from time immemorial the time that we've always been here and there were generations here and now we're being thrown off because of, uh, because of the, uh, you know, the people in Beirut selling the lands. Um, there's also, there's a huge Ottoman document ab about, um, suddenly it slipped my mind, the, the main person, Elias, um, who was selling the land, the last name, 
um, of the, of the at the end. But no, it, it's the one that had the, the huge, beautiful palace in Beirut. Sursu. Sursu, yeah, yeah. So the biggest, you know, the biggest land seller before <clears throat> the war was was the Sursu family. He, exactly. So they write a lot. There's a huge document of the Sursuks, and I haven't gone back to look at it to go because it, it really deserves a whole uh, article on its own, how they were able to do this. But I think the, the extent that people knew about this, I want to do a, a, a side note about this. It's very interesting that the, 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 the head of the most notable Sursuk um, was actually died in the Beirut explosion. The, the, the palace was, was um, and what came out and when the Israeli press was in 1975 or 82, um, she actually got some compensation for the land they lost. Linda. Um, Linda. Uh, yeah. Yes. I saw and I, and I, I had no idea that it's one of the few cases where Israel has actually paid compensation for land that they took in 1948. I thought that was, that, that was, it was fascinating. When, well, I so mean, in her, yeah. A huge amount. So, so yeah. So people were very aware of it. Of course, that the, the, the buying of this land is what set off the I would say that the, the, the local urban elite say, you know, we have to adopt the peasant cause. Because if we don't adopt the peasant cause, we're not we're not going to be anything here. Yeah. And I think that's a moment. That's a and, and of course, that's I mean, you worked on it extensively. And I think you know the Fula incident is the moment where we see a huge transformation into, I would say, the beginnings of a conflict. Um, that, that's going to include urban urban elite also. We, we have 12 more minutes um, and we have okay, five more questions. Let me just add one more thing about this uh, land purchase. Um, a lot of this has to do with a, with a change in Ottoman land laws starting in 1858, whereby land that had formerly been either communally held under Musha or had, be held, had been held such that the peasants had right of use of rock and could not be removed from the land as long as they cultivated and paid taxes was changed to a form of private property. And what happened was mm -hmm. uh, people in the provincial centers like Beirut, which was the capital of much of, of the province that included much of Northern Palestine, um, ended up registering land in their name, such that the peasants who, as the petition Louis mentioned, said, we've always been here. This is our land. We've cultivated it forever because of this change of land law and a move towards capitalist relations in the countryside, um, suddenly were no longer the owners and no longer had rights, which had been traditionally, um, they had, which they had traditionally had. Okay, um, we have several um, more questions. A quick question from Margareta McBean. How difficult was it to get Ottoman Jews to adopt Hebrew as their universal language? And we have several other questions. So let's try and- So quickly. really quickly, really quickly to the, this question, um, the adopting of Hebrew was only among Ottoman Jews in Jerusalem. I think by, by the 1908 uh, Young Turk Revolution, it's clear that Hebrew is going to be the, the dominant language of the Jewish issue, whether you're Sephardic, whether you're Zionist, whether you're non-Zionist, whether it's newspaper Moria, which is a religious newspaper that wasn't Zionist, um, or it's Herut, HaKherut, the Sephardic, or the, the Hatzvi. Uh, what we see, though, is that um, some Ottoman Zionism was this idea within the Ottoman Empire, whether it's Izmir, or Istanbul, or Damascus, or Beirut, was the adopting of Hebrew for the kindergarten classes to teach them basic Hebrew in the in the kindergarten kindergarten classes. It was by no means to adopt it as the main language. So that that really separates Palestine different from uh, when I say Palestine from all the way to Safad to Tiberias to you know, the the idea was Hebrew was going to be the main uh, language of communication. It didn't happen outside. Interestingly, uh, Yiddish remains in New York and in other centers of Jewish emigration, much more important. Um, Mokhtar mm -hmm. Kaukash, uh, two questions, please. Um, I just lost that. There we are. Can you say more about the dynamics between Arab Jews in Palestine and the region and European Zionists? Um, the second question, what have you learned about Zionist enterprises, commerce, real estate, and so forth, and advocacy? in Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt. Well, in the pre-1914 period, not so much, I imagine. But anyway, Louis, further, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll say quickly that I think this pre-1914 period, because of each group being very autonomous, as, as I stated before, um, uh, you know, through Hebrew, 
these, these differences are starting to disappear. I'll only say one thing, and I think it's very important, and this is something that I want to work on, is that during this period, how I understand, and much more after writing the book, is that the Ottoman Jewish Sephardic community was much more central to the Zionist um, uh, community in Palestine than, than previously assessed. And I think that, that, that is important to think about that, that it's not that they were written out of, it's not that they were disenfranchised as they were later on within the 20s and 30s, and the rise of Ben Gurionism and the Ashkenazi establishment, that I don't really see that Ashkenazi establishment in the pre-1914 period. The last thing about Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt, if there were Zionist enterprises there, it was more just to, uh, as uh, Hebrew, as sort of as a national language. And you see, in, for example, in Beirut in this period, you have a, a play being held in um, Hebrew and, and they put street signs in Hebrew for people, but they, they realize that no one's gonna understand it also. Um, and the Damascus community was much more um, based in Arabic. The one city that you don't see this is in, in Baghdad. Baghdad, uh, the Ottoman parliamentarian um, really already um, draws a line between, between his Ottoman identity and there not being really a need to learn any Hebrew whatsoever. So that's someone that, that's different than the Ottoman Sephardic parliamentarian, parliamentarian Izmir, Nesim Asliyan, that believes it should be in the schools. For them, that was Zionism because we have to remember that no one can foresee the fall of the empire once again. So they see this as a Jewish autonomous homeland, which it could have turned out to be also, you know what I mean? Who knows? We don't do what ifs in history. I, I, I see the question about famine. Is that the, ne the next question? Yeah, it um, is. Yeah, yeah um, I haven't really dug deep into why um, immigration, but I think it, it was the, the overall, uh, I wouldn't say famine in this period, I didn't see that, but the, the, the loss of, of work, the, the unimportance of, uh, or the inability to build a life off of, 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 of farming and peasantry um, and moving towards the cities. So I, I see it's much, of course, during the war that changes, but I, I think it was much more of an economic motivated um, immigration than anything else. I think the introduction of capitalist relations in the countryside and a process whereby um, workers are alienated from the land that they had formerly had rights to. Uh, and that's a process that's accelerated by Zionist colonization, obviously, but it's an ongoing process all, all over the region. Um, so I think that that is more of a driver. During World War I, there was famine, of course, and that was a driver of immigration. And I would add another factor, which is conscription. Some people were fleeing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Roberto Maza says, if I, I, if I may, I just want to add a comment in my recent work on the Western Wall, Jamal Pasha trying to sell the Western Wall in the Mohrabi area in 1916 to the Zionist, which, by the way, is the subject of, of, of recent work. I'll talk about it in a minute uh, by uh, Vincent Le Maire. Uh, uh, he's about to publish on this, uh, among other things, about the about the Harit uh, al the Mohrabi uh, district. I realized, he continues, Maza, I realized the relevance of what Rashid mentioned in relation to fears. Quite interestingly, I noticed that also Zionists living in the Ottoman Empire were very much aware of Arab fears in, rel in relation to Western powers, possibly taking over the holy places. I think the nationalist lenses through which we've looked at this period for a long time are slowly being replaced by others, including religion, which has often been discarded. I take this as a comment rather than a question. Lastly, thanks for organizing this event. Um, so I, unless you want to say something, Louis, do you want to, I just want to say that when I first, um, I was, uh, with Roberto, when he presented this in the, uh, the center for Palestinian studies in Ramallah, um, that's not the, the name, what is it? The Institute for Palestinian studies in Ramallah. And I was just flabbergasted. I said, what Jamal Pasha was trying to sell this. And this is happening five years after the Harmel Sharif incident. It's one of the craziest stories I heard of. And thing, I, I, can't, I can't wait to read the article uh, because uh, I think it really shows us once again things that we don't know about. Vincent Nomer, who's written two histories of Jerusalem, one about water and another, um, uh, has, has done an enormous amount of research on Harit al about the Moroccan quarter. And he mm -hmm. has a whole section on this weird, it's a peculiar incident. Um, another question 
from Rama Sifri. Thanks for this enlightening conversation. It comes back to the same topic. Can you address Ottoman Jews and the Zionist press continuing to praise the Ottoman Empire and the architects of the Armenian genocide? This takes us into World War One, but uh, uh, Louis, can, is there something you can say about this? Yeah, you know, the, 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 the Jewish press, first of all, I think it, all accounts, if you go back to the war years, they're very aware of the massacre of Armenians uh, taking place, and they actually fear it's their own future if they're not careful. On the other hand, you do have people like Carmi Effendi that I mentioned that are fighting. Now, what's interesting about the Ottoman Zionists fighting the army, it's a bit different than the Sephardic communities and the Palestinians that you had mentioned um, um, that are, are actually leaving Palestine because they don't want to be conscripted. Because now we have a new group of ideology, ideologists, pro-Ottomans, you know, Jewish people saying, we want to go fight. For the Ottoman Sephardic community, the last thing you want to do is fight for, you know, for the, I'm talking about the majority. Of course, you can find those that, that are, are, are super patriotic and are going to fight. So I think that that is, um, um, we get a new group, and that's Moshe Shered, and there's numerous other people. And they have been completely written out of the Israeli um, history because it really goes against the thread here. It really goes to show that they didn't know, you know. I'll end by saying no one talks, everyone loves to say Ben Gurion was in Istanbul, but no one wants to do anything with it further because it really shows that he wanted to become a perhaps an Ottoman parliamentarian and he never foresaw that it was going to be an independent state. The rise of Ben Gurion's story really comes in the 1920s. It does not come during this period at all. I think he may have been affected by his time in the United States also which is the most mm -hmm. uh, understudied part of his of this man's incredible biography. Uh, Hassan Fauzi, uh, our colleague here uh, at, at Columbia uh, in the library now, um, says, don't you think that the term using the term absentee landlords contradicts your theme of research to see Palestine as an Ottoman issue, which means that being in Beirut is not an absentee in relation to Haifa or Yaffa. I, I mean, you have a point, Hassan, because um, it's true, uh, Beirut is not uh, absentee would imply that they're living abroad. Obviously, they're not living abroad. I think you can apply absentee landlord to anyone who's not living on or near the land. So someone in Jaffa or Haifa could be an absentee landlord in relation to a village, you know, 20 kilometers away or 30 kilometers away, in other words, not living on the land. But I think the right term would be capitalist landlords. Um, the, the, many, of these, many of these landlords uh, uh, got control of, of property, some of it uncultivated, but some of it cultivated uh, through a variety of means, uh, having mainly to do with influence that they had at the provincial centers, whether it was Jerusalem in the Mutasarafi, or whether it was Beirut in the Wilayat Beirut. Um, and uh, some, some, in some cases, you see these grand or orange groves being, being, being developed in areas that had not been cultivated before. In our, other areas like Maj ibn Amr, the Emek, the, the what's it, the Vale of Jezreel, the area running southeast from Haifa down to Bisen, a very fertile valley, um, where the Sursos and the Twainis and the Aryans sold a huge amount of land. Um, we are talking about people who bought the land as an investment and improved it in some cases, i.e. moved the peasants off and instituted capitalist agriculture, but in other cases, simply sold the, the land with the villages and the peasants to the Zionist land purchase agencies. Um, do you want to say anything about this? Uh, Louis? Uh, I'll this just actually, say quickly that unfortunately, this is the last question. We have to we have to end in a minute. Yeah, I, I would just say that in, yes, it contradicts the the Ottomanness of this, but uh, some of them were in the independent Mutasarif. They weren't in the Beirut Vilayati, and they were in the in the independent Maron Maronite. And this is um, the the document that I told you I really want to look into. Actually, talks about them able to make these cells because they are not directly connected to the Ottoman um, uh, administration. Um, because In the Mutasarafi of, of Mount Lebanon. Yes, exactly, exactly, uh, the independent uh, of Lebanon. Um, so so that, would, that would make the difference. And the other thing is that the Palestinians really differentiate local, uh, local families, notable selling the land, and the ones in Lebanon. I think there's a, there's a, there's a for, for, you know, of course, they're not, they're all Ottomans, but there is a sense of the local, localness of Palestinians. And 
If someone from Jerusalem is selling it, the dynamics are very different. The pressuring is different. Lobbying against them is very different than when it happens in Lebanon. So I think it does make sense to also use this absentee in terms of, of the local population and their understandings that these people weren't from here. They were coming here to do exactly what you, what you explained. We're going to have to bring it to an end. There are a couple more comments and questions, but we just don't have time. Uh, Louis, I want to thank you. I want to thank all the people who hung with us. We had over almost not, over 90, and we still have 72 participants, and I assume more uh, on the Facebook live stream. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for what all the questioners at least thought was an illuminating talk. I thought was illuminating. Uh, I, I, I would suggest to you to go and buy the book published uh, as part of Edinburgh Studies on the Ottoman Empire, or at least get your university library to buy the book. It's a very expensive book, unfortunately. And good news, I didn't tell you, it came out in paperback. Um, ah, three well, weeks maybe ago. you can't afford it now. You can't <laughs> afford it now. It was always very embarrassing telling people they would like, we, 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 you know, we want to buy the book. And I would say, ah, well, it's over $100. Now it's 25 bucks. You can get it on Amazon or at Edinburgh. Um, uh, thanks so much for having me. It was, it was, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the talk. And I can't wait till this pandemic is over and then I can cross over into Manhattan and we can have a coffee or tea together. Inshallah. I hope so. Looking forward so to much, it. Sir. Louis, thank you to all of our, uh, uh, all of you who sat in and, and st stayed with us. Thank you very much for participating. Um, and I look forward to you all uh, joining us for future events uh, organized by the Center for Palestine Studies. Thank you very much.